start with talking about what the Mindful Initiative is and, and why we, we are interested in these awards. Um, if you know about the work of the Mindfulness Initiative, we, we have been about putting mindfulness at the heart of policy and decision making. And a lot of our work goes around working, focusing our work on Westminster, working with parliamentarians um, to actually look at um, how mindfulness can create a landscape um, through which um, mindfulness innovation can thrive. So looking at creating a policy landscape that is means that, that mindfulness can actually pick up and start reaching the parts um, that other interventions can't reach. So we've done an awful lot of work in terms of our Mindful Nation report, looking at policy areas around health and education and the criminal justice system and emergency services and, and looking at how mindfulness can, can make a real difference within those policy areas. Um, and we've looked at the connection between mindfulness and, and climate change and, and how mindfulness can create agency um, within the modern world um, and also our recent work around climate youth resilience in terms of um, how how contemplative practice and mindfulness can help young people who are, uh, who are dealing with climate emotions who are, who are dealing with climate anxiety um, and how contemplative practice can help turn those anxieties into positive action so a lot of the work we do is top down, um, but I think we strongly feel that we're not just in the corridors of power trying to change policy, trying to change legislation, trying to make a world where mindfulness is taken seriously and the evidence base is, is strong for the efficacy of, of that intervention. We also recognize that the reason that we were doing this is to create that fertile landscape for mindfulness and mindfulness based programs and activities and interventions to grow and flourish. So for me, it's like the analogy of building a tunnel and we can build a tunnel on one side of a river um, and start doing the top down stuff. Um, and people who are doing grassroots work work within communities are digging on the other side of the river and actually those things have got to meet in the middle so for me um, supporting innovation in mindfulness is about seeing the seeds that are growing within the landscape and actually looking at interventions that reach audiences reach communities reach individuals who really need the benefits of mindfulness, but for whatever reason, haven't been able to access the programs and the and, and the opportunities that mindfulness has created up until this point. So none of this is about saying that existing programs and training programs and eight week courses and need to be moved away from, but we do recognize that for lots of people within communities, particularly individuals who are considered hard to reach groups, um, people who are othered within society. Um, a lo lot of people within those communities are feel unable, evidence shows, to access the current programmes. So we want to see innovation actually moving the boundaries and, and that's why we're doing that. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Vin to, to add his dimension from the Heart No Foundation Trust and, and, and see um, what Vin would like to add to that. Thanks, Richard. Welcome, everybody. Um, well, it was two or three years ago I had an idea that seemed a bit crazy um, to have a, a kind of, and when I told some of my pals, they thought it was a bit weird to have what sounded like a competition for mindfulness. And uh, it took a bit of digging under the surface and explaining and teasing out the idea. But really where I was coming from was when I, when I approached it was Jamie. Jamie at the time was looking after the mindfulness initiative. It was this idea that the, the, the field book had been created, you know, by Menka and Jamie. And it's a fantastic piece of work. It's a great resource. The ethos behind it that came out for me in, in summer is that mindfulness has done such a great job 
you know, establishing itself, establishing credibility, respectability, effectiveness. But there are still people that it hasn't reached and that we need as a, a field, an industry or whatever we want to call ourselves, we, we need to reach out to more and more people and that might require innovation and it might require imagination and creativity. But at the same time, we need to have some sense of responsibility and care that we don't undo all of the good work and also that we don't do harm, of course. So how could we do that? And I felt that by setting up an award scheme for the mindfulness and innovation would mean that we could kind of steer the conversation towards best practice. Um, so uh, when, when we did the first set of awards, and we're going to use the same, same principle, we've, we've kept, chose very carefully the criteria that we were measuring, uh, because I think that steers people towards thinking creatively, but also thinking responsibly. And I think also it's unlikely that innovation is going to come from the, the relatively big training organizations because their job is to run good programs and, and train teachers. But this is more about the people out in the field who are likely to take innovation and mindfulness into the groups of people with whom they feel and have a particular professional or per personal connection and understanding. That's when we can innovate, is when we understand how the, the, the barriers, the inspirations, the difficulties of, of people that are, are stopping them so far from connecting with mindfulness. So that's kind of how it came about. And, and we set up the awards in partnership between a, a trust that I co-founded co and the Mindfulness Initiative. And I guess the other aspect of it was it, it's not really a competition, but it's a way of celebrating the achievements of individuals who otherwise could go unrecognized. Um, and that's been a strong theme that's come out in the conversations with the people who applied and particularly the ones who became the finalists that we got to know quite well. There's like, it was just great to be recognized. Um, and it also created a kind of sense of community around innovation. And I think it made help to make really good connections. So, it was, and then I think the other bit of it, as well as celebrating the existing achievements and successes was for other people to be able to see, well, if they can do that, maybe I could do something. And kind of, if you can see it, you can be it. So it was, an, it was celebrating on the one hand and inspiring on the other hand. I think that's where we're coming from. Um, there's a little bit of autobiography in it, I guess, because uh, in my own life and business, um, I've always been involved in innovation of a, a woodworking business, as well as having been a meditator for many years. And very early days in that, we won a sort of business award. And I knew the amount of benefit that came to my business from that. So I think that maybe helped me to think of, of the idea in the first place. And the feedback from the people that participated, whether they were the, the, the finalists who the, the, the benefit to them, I think, has really exceeded our expectations in terms of credibility and connections and opening the doors to other funding, but also in the people who just did good applications. And we really took our time to connect with them and consult with them, not just sort of, no, you didn't become a finalist. We really had good good conversations, good exchange with them. And I think they felt appreciated, understood, heard, and they also got something from it. So I guess that that's why I, I want to contribute to to help the mindfulness innovators themselves, but also with the motivation to reach people who maybe need mindfulness more than I do, but don't have access to it because they haven't found a way that of approaching it that resonates with them. So that was a bit of a download and probably enough from me for now, thank you. Thanks, Finn. I'm gonna hand over now to, to Menka. Um, is going to take us through 
the application form and the criteria to the three categories in this this year's awards. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. It's um, a pleasure to be here with you all. The, um, I want to go back to last uh, the last awards as well, um, like um, Vin did. This is a photo from the awards ceremony with one of the finalist teams, the Urban Mindfulness Foundation. And the purpose of the awards was to encourage and, and celebrate, as Vin said, new ideas in the mindfulness space, to break down barriers and to welcome new voices, and also to emphasize the importance of evidence. A few people did comment, as as, um, as, um, we've, as, as we feared, I guess, um, either out loud or, or just with their eyes, that it was a bit strange to pit people against each other in an outright competition when all of us here are mindfulness practitioners. But um, we did do it very differently. We did it with a spirit of celebration, and there was a real joy in each other's success and a sense of opportunity for everyone to grow as a result of, of the whole field growing. It was about inclusion. And um, this is one of my favorite sayings about innovation when it's done with this attitude of openness, which is that a rising tide lifts all boats. And um, I'm so pleased that um, a year and a half on from that event, there are so many ripples that we're seeing, people who didn't know each other before the awards, now collaborating, partnering, applying for funding together, investing in each other, sitting on each other's boards. And that's what it's all about for me. And um, I'm really happy that we're doing this again. This photograph is um, two of the finalists, Luke Doherty, who created BAM, the Boxing and Mindfulness Program, uh, with Mia Chambers from Mind. This was a photo on the LinkedIn after co-delivering a session on leadership a few weeks ago. So um, there are a few changes that we have made, improvements, I hope, from last time. And the major one is that um, we now have three distinct categories. And I, I instantly regret now saying distinct because, of course, they're very overlapped as well. <laughs> but the point is that um, having three categories allows us to focus on supporting early stage ideas in a more diverse set of contexts. So let me explain um, this a bit more. The evidence for mindfulness, for stress reduction, for depression, chronic illness, pain, anxiety, and many other conditions is now, is now immense. I mean, there's no question that it's effective and, and important to our mental health, especially. And this chart here shows the growth in scientific journal articles about mindfulness over the past two decades. Um, but one of the efforts of the Mindfulness Initiative, as uh, Richard explained at the beginning, is that we've been trying to make the case for mindfulness being a foundational capacity that's relevant to how we live more broadly and how we relate to each other. So mindfulness impacts you know, how we respond to the climate crisis, our capacity to take action without falling into despair. Mindfulness impacts our capacity to, to bear witness to, to war, um, to the suffering of others, to be able to attend to the world, even when it's difficult to do that. And mindfulness impacts our relationship with technology as that tech becomes more and more deeply embedded into our lives. So tech's not just something we use or somewhere we go online, but it's becoming who we are. And so through these awards, we want to take a more holistic lens and encourage mindfulness training in a broader, more systemic way. So uh, let me explain the three categories. The first one is the most conventional one, um, training programs. I mean, there are some amazing evidence-based programs out there, and there's no need to reinvent those wheels. But the wheels can be put on a different vehicle or driven to a new neighborhood or adapted for a different terrain. I'm not sure how much further I can go with this metaphor, so I'll just switch to to plain English, we're looking for significant adaptations to training, you know, whether it's online, in person, an app, or hybrid. The point is that uh, we're looking for things that are addressing unmet needs. So for example, it could be a creative adaptation to serve a new population, 
particularly a marginalized or underrepresented one, or it could be serving an existing population, but in a better, deeper, a more engaging way. And all our finalists last year were in this category. We're hoping to see some more wonderful projects of this type again this, this year. And then the second category is um, one that I'm really passionate about. Uh, it is about the intentional and creative use of technology. Last year, we had some applications about using wearables, AI, and other tech to introduce mindfulness to people in new ways. But mostly they were very early stage, especially in terms of evidence, which actually made it quite um, hard to evaluate, especially in comparison with other training programs. So this time we wanted to make a special call out to these projects. And this is the area that I, I work in um, um, outside of the mindfulness initiative and, and looking at the relationship between the mind and technology. Of course, the intimacy is, is both terrifying, but it's also very exciting because we can now work with our minds in new ways. We can make the technology work for us um, in the context of mindfulness. So we're looking at, um, at people who are leveraging, leveraging this digital tech, uh, this emerging field and building evidence, which, which admittedly might be at very early stage, but we're looking for a rigorous and ethical approach to testing and validating their concept. So excited to see what applications we get on that front. And then the third one is, um, is about partnerships so this is also really exciting because it's outward facing you know this isn't about mindfulness people speaking to each other in our cozy niche um, but speaking to climate change groups political movements schools prisons corporates it's about looking sideways um, we want to celebrate the collaborations that broaden the scope of mindfulness and afterwards make us think ah oh, yeah it makes so much sense that mindfulness would be useful in that context but it's the partnership that makes it um, makes it possible. The unlikely allies that are expanding and enhancing what mindfulness means. Um, we're looking at that exchange of ideas, skills, and reach. So I think um, this is. Um, so the, what I forgot to mention is is this category and the technology category are also going to be an experiment for us in terms of um, broadening the the geographic reach. So we're open to applications that are. Are from anywhere, but um, we are looking um, for the creative partnerships one that at least one of the partners is based in the UK. Um, and the reason for that is just because uh, as we you know, iterate and develop the, our, our knowledge base, our networks, our judges are primarily UK based. And so this is where we feel the most confident to be able to assess whether something is truly novel um, and innovative. So those are the three categories. If you have any questions, let's get into them after I finished. I'm just going to take you through the, the six criteria that um, Vin mentioned as well. Uh, so the application form is, is created around these six criteria and the judging is also happening on, on exactly the same criteria. So it's pretty transparent as far as um, applications go. Uh, so the first one, and, and our motto since the beginning has been about this, is about celebrating creativity that meets real needs. So is it clear what problem is being solved? And that's another way of asking the same question. You know, is it clear who this is for? And how much have you engaged the people that this is for? So one of the key things I want to highlight here is that this need or problem doesn't have to be universal. It doesn't have to be for everyone. It's just that it has to be well researched, clearly defined, and ideally in partnership with those people so that you're not kind of doing it to them, but with them and for them. So that's the first one. The second one is about creativity and risk taking. So what makes your offering different from existing offerings? As we've just discussed, there's plenty of great evidence based offerings out there. But there's also room for further ideas, both in terms of what's being taught and how it's being taught. So we're curious um, to know about what sets you apart. What are you doing that will diversify the field? And so a lot of it's about awareness about what already exists and how you've differentiated your offering. 
this um, third criteria is, does this innovation increase the reach of mindfulness? Does it show sensitivity around factors in, such as language and cost and perception, um, racial, um, cultural, economic factors? There's so many things that can create barriers for people. And so a big emphasis in this award is, is, is how do we make you know, effective mindfulness training accessible and appealing to those who don't currently practice? And in what ways are you trying to make um, your offering as inclusive as possible? And, and, and of course, there's going to be barriers uh, in doing so. So um, in the field book, yeah, we have uh, done an updated section about, um, about this, um, going into resources as well, especially around race. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. It's um, section 3.5, I think, in the field book. And then number four, testing and iterating. So any intervention, no matter how good the intentions, has the potential to harm people or let them down in different ways. And I mean, that's not just um, kind of, I mean, that's just the, the reality of it. And, and to, to approach um, innovation with that humility is very important. So where does your confidence come from that this innovation will be safe and effective? So it's not about having a strong evidence base from the get-go. It's about how we gradually build our confidence and proof that this is, this is going to be safe and effective. So questions you might want to ask yourself is, you know, is there a trained mindfulness teacher involved? Um, do you or can you set up partnerships with academic or research organizations you know, that, that love looking at the evidence? So you know, that's not something you necessarily have to do yourself. Um, have you challenged your own cognitive biases? so that you can actually take a kind of a, a very um, objective look at whether this is working or not. Because often these things start as a passion project, but wh wh when, when do you get to the point where you, where you take a third, per third um, party perspective on it? And in the field book, um, we have uh, this, which is known as the evidence hierarchy or the evidence pyramid. And um, you know, at the bottom, you have things like expert opinion, and at the top, you have um, RCTs and meta-analysis. So, you know, it, it, it's about moving up this, um, this hierarchy. Again, that's in the field book, um, uh, section 4.4. Then the fifth criteria we've got is about um, you know, let's um, be realistic about innovation being a collaborative endeavor. It's rarely a private endeavor, especially when it gets to growth and scale. So who are you being inspired by? How are you listening and learning? Equally, how are you sharing your work and knowledge or, or contributing towards other people's projects in, 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 in some way? So we're interested to learn about any partnerships, any collaborations, or any communities that you're actively part of, as well as other ways in which you're learning and contributing. And I guess a question you could ask yourself is if, if you succeed, then what is the impact going to be on, on, on other projects? And then um, the final criteria, and this is perhaps the most challenging, um, is about uh, kind of financial sustainability and, um, and therefore impact over time. So how are you currently financing this work and what is your plan going ahead? You know, what is the business model and how might that change in the future as well? So if your project relies on in-person mindfulness training, then we'd like to know about how many trainers or instructors you imagine that you might need and, and what are your thoughts on securing them? So um, another question would be, you know, if you, if you um, don't have a, a viable business model at this point in time, you know, what, what are your ideas or, or plans to, to develop one? Um, and, and another kind of a question for further down the line is, is, is if you do have intentions to grow and scale, like how, how um, might you do this without compromising the integrity of the core idea? So that's very much about implementation and impact. And then, um, just to, to close, um, I mentioned the field book 
few times already, um, but the, uh, the exciting thing uh, that has happened in the last few months is that it's it's now on a website, so it's easy to access. It's innovationsandmindfulness.org is is the the microsite, and um, uh, in addition to the field book, there's also a growing number of blog posts from other innovators' stories uh, for inspiration, um, ideas, and um, we hope that uh, that you know you you feel that um, even just by being on this call and thinking about applying, that you're part of this community of um, innovators that are thinking about how to do things differently and how to do them better. So. Um, I hope you. Um, I hope that many of you decide to apply. Uh, many people last time said that it was helpful to their project to just read and to try and respond to the questions on these six criteria in our application form. You know, it, it can be a exercise in in reflection, which is um, constructive. Uh, meanwhile, our job is going to be to try and make the process as smooth and inclusive, welcome um, as possible. Last time we um, gave feedback to nearly every applicant. Uh, which is pretty unheard of with awards like this. And depending on the volume of applicants, you know, our, our hope is to try and do as much of that again um, this year as, as possible. So um, thank you for your attention. And regardless of these awards, thank you for your work in this field. Uh, wishing you all the very best with your projects. Thank you, Menka. I think we're going to hand over to Eileen now. Um, to have a look at the website um, and, and, and how that works. So, that show, so how that's navigable, navigable, you can get around it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Menka. Um, I hope that you've already had a bit of a look around the, the website, but just to give you a whistle-stop tour, um, this is the area Menka mentioned, which has field book now loaded into it it's divided into different sections so that you can easily navigate skip to the section that you feel would be most useful for you um we've also got this section which we've called community because it feels so important to understand that um innovation doesn't happen in a silo is the phrase that we've been using and so that seeing other people's work, connecting with other innovators, um, potential funders, people working in the same space can be so useful. If you have ideas for a, a blog post or even a, a mini micro blog post that you'd like to share, do get in touch because we'd love to fill this page with different perspectives. And then the awards section of the site will show you some background and some a little bit of history the videos of the finalists from our last round of awards are here and some FAQs, some of which we might touch on now as we get into your, uh, your questions. And using the button at the top of the page, you can get into information specific to this year's awards, including the categories that Manka just talked us through, the prizes, a timeline which crucially tells you the submission deadline for application 7th of May. So please make sure you have your forms in by then. Uh, also, then a key date is the 19th of October. We're really pleased to be partnering with the Manchester Mindfulness Festival this year and announcing the winners at the festival. Um, and obviously the judging process goes on between those two points. And the criteria that Manka walked us through are here as well. If we use this button to take us into the apply here section, that's where you find the form itself to download and a DEI monitoring form, which is really helpful for us to, to have. Not, not obligatory, but um, in, it's really key for us to understand who we're reaching with these awards because um, part of the point is to make sure that uh, mindfulness can reach groups that at the moment aren't don't have access to mindfulness. So. Uh, thank you if you are if you are willing to share that information with us. Um, this email address, innovations uh, at mindfulness initiative, is there for you to get in touch with us with any questions. And please feel free to reach out whatever's on your mind. Um, and one last thing to point out is this little LinkedIn button because we've created a LinkedIn community for 
specifically for innovations and mindfulness, specifically for you and other people that are interested in this field. So do join us there for more information as we go on through this process and beyond. I think that's it from me. Thank you, Monica. I think where we are now is we're ready to open up the floor and ask if anybody has any questions or uh, any queries or any observations that they'd like to share or, or ask any of us. Yes, Simena. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I am uh, considering applying again. <laughs> um, and um, just going through the feedback from the last time. Um, so the innovation uh, which that, that I applied last time or the project that I applied is kind of the same project, but now I have a bit more of experience in this project. So my first question is, is it okay to apply with the same project that we applied last time? I think I answered all the panelists. Absolutely yes, of course. Um, and as you say, the, the project will have evolved and developed and, and you would have gained more experience over that time. So yes, by all means, please do apply again. Thank you. And I have a second question. <laughs> That's very good news. Um, I'm an artist, so I didn't study necessarily mindfulness as, as I understand you follow the training. I train, I'm a deep listening practitioner and I train deep listening, which is can be considered as a part of mindfulness. I understand that mindfulness has a very kind of specific, more, more scientific way to collect it, to collect evidence. While, while the form of an artist collective evidence is um, particularly in the, in the context in which I have um, delivered this experience um, is a bit different is more kind of quality, qualitative um, commentary is, is a bit different. So I just wonder this rigor that you um, invite us to have in evidence, um, what are kind of the, the, the possibilities to go across that or if it's specifically um, I need to check again the field, the, the book, but but I would like to know if there are parameters that you see and you say, this is not here, so this is not following this. So I ask it also for, even if at this time, I don't have it in that way that there is evidence, which I think I probably don't have it in those terms, but it would be really nice to know what are the terms when we come from different trainings uh, that are also mindfulness, but are different? Would anybody from the panel like to come back on that? Yeah, I, I, I guess um, two things come to mind. Um, um, I'm really pleased that you're looking at applying again, having, having developed your project further. And um, uh, be interesting to to um, to know what your journey's been. Um, but in terms of in terms of these kind of uh, related fields that aren't exactly um, or specifically mindfulness uh, in the way that um, we we generally define it in in um, the more formal the mindfulness sector, then um, I think that that that's still incredibly useful and. Um, uh, uh, the, then it's just about positioning it so that it ex you know, you're explaining what the relationship is between deep listening and mindfulness. Um, and then in terms of um, uh, evidence um, gathering, uh, you know, that's something that I, I, um, I find really interesting too, because when you speak to researchers, there's one uh, kind of 
generally speaking, like one acceptable way of going about doing research. But then if you speak to other other disciplines in industry or in design or in um, in, in art, um, the process of gathering evidence, it, it, can, it can be quite different. Um, and I don't think that um, we are limiting it to just one type of evidence. It's, it's more, it's, so the, the question that I, that I would um, ask is, you know, what gives you the confidence that this is safe and effective, that you're not going to be letting people down, that you're not going to be, um, you know, in, inviting someone to, to the course on a false kind of promise? Um, because th there's real cost to that, you know, even if, if it's as simple as something like um, someone's um, having a really tough time and, and, and want to do something good for themselves to help themselves, and they decide to take a course and 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 maybe this is the only one they're going to try and if it doesn't help them in the way that they were hoping then you you we've kind of let, let them down in quite a meaningful way um so so th so that's that's the reason for the evidence um emphasis but um it doesn't have to be only in in one format so i'd be really interested to know like in your domain of art what does the process look like so just and if you feel that the word limit is the issue because we've kept it quite tight 200 words or 300 words then you know just um send us an email and just say like there's there's a different attachment that i need to include to explain why this evidence is relevant thanks a lot this is really helpful thank you thank you Anne marie you you indicated you wanted to speak yes thank you uh, um, the project that I'm doing is a technology project, um, but it's it's completely self-funded um, within the uh, within the um, University of Warwick as a of the self-funded PhD. And um, I just wanted to know whether or not um, the fact that the project is already being researched within that context, if um, that in some way excludes the project, even though there's no funding involved with the project, because I'm funding it myself. I, um, can I just clarify, Anne-Marie, do you mean to say, yeah. is, is, are you concerned that because there's a large organisation involved, yeah. that we might not yeah. consider it as an early stage innovation? Yes, yeah, although it's um, basically, it's a um, it's an app that includes community spaces. So, um, and it's currently, um, it is currently being researched, the use of it is being researched by myself. And, um, uh, but it's part of a PhD, but it's not a funded PhD. So it's completely been funded by myself. Yeah. I, I, it sounds completely fine uh, oh, right. uh, okay. first hearing about it. Um, it my, my concern would be less about um, the fact that it's linked with um, the university and more about um, whether it's uh, still in research phase because um, our, our, yes, our focus is, is on you know on, on projects which are kind of road tested to an extent which you've, you've, you've tried you've tried um, it out with um, a real, Kind of group of people who are the target audience, and um, as opposed to re research participants. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So basically, the research participant phase finishes in four weeks. So if beyond that, I'm able to um, try it out on a on a um, on the target audience, that would be acceptable. Yeah, I mean, it's you're still moving up the the evidence hierarchy. In yes, terms of, of course, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. you're still yeah. researching, you're still learning. It's an ongoing process, but Absolutely, it's it's, yeah. it's getting closer to the real world context. So yeah, that would yes. be really great to see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's more than just an idea. It's that you've, you. Oh gosh, yes, it's out yeah, there. Then, yes. Then, yeah, yes. of course. Then that's great. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I would add that in in terms of the funding, I think we need to be innovative and imaginative on how we're going to turn something from an idea into a reality, and it doesn't even matter. Yes. Yeah. Because it's 
anything to do with technology is extremely costly and um it's a field that's still um i mean my only way of getting this to the stage that i got it at to the research to this research phase it's been through one research phase now going through a secondary research phase but it's completely self-funded mm -hmm. um because until you get to a certain stage even with uh technology innovations um uh, it's funding is extremely difficult to come by i think within the application form you'll have scope to explain what the avenues might be as well you know yeah yeah uh, yes yeah 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 well in fact it's quite interestingly already revealed areas that other that highly commercial apps are now looking at. So it's in, it's very important um, research, but still at this stage, because what tends to happen with technology and mindfulness, well, technology and education in general, is that the experts are not the people fueling the technology. The experts in the area are not the people who are fueling the push towards the technology. So the technology is being, is basically being pushed forward by app builders and not by um, people with the, ex with the experience on the ground of mm. education and mindfulness and how to create learning and reciprocal communities. It's quite interesting. Thanks, Anne Marie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, John raised his hand and then E after that, but John. Thanks. Um, you mentioned the three categories. I'm just wondering what happens if uh, an innovation crosses those, if it relates to two of them? Would it be necessary to specify just one area? Or could one apply within both? I answered. Um, John, uh, if, if so, choose, choose one. And in the shortlisting process, if we feel that your application is better suited to another category, then we'll switch it with permission from you. So, okay, so you apply for one, but then you might come back and say better. Actually, this would be a better fit for this, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Hey, E. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Richard. Um, I'm Eleanor. I have a question which um, kind of built on what Anne-Marie was saying, really, about um, funding and self-funding the project. Um, and it was relating to the, the award prize of money. So is that is that funding that's to go towards the work? And if so, does that mean that the work needs to be delivered within the 2024 um, award cycle? Um, no, the money isn't going to, the, 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 the money for the award is prize money. So the money can be spent however you wish to spend it. Um, so that could be spent developing your project or, or however you need to, to use that money at that time. So we're not attaching any strings or any restrictions to, to the prize money. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, are you able to say what the what the prize money is, or is that somewhere else on the website? Um, we haven't finalised that yet. We're still working on that. Okay. That's fine. Cool. Thank you. What I, I would add is that um, la in the last awards, I think the value to people was way more than the prize money. Actually, mm. in the end, yeah. Yeah, totally. I can appreciate that. I think yeah. that was one of the the main feedback we got and having spoken to to to, to all of the the finalists um of, of the last awards many of them talked about the funding doors that that being in the awards actually opened for mm -hmm. them um because yeah. it actually got their project recognized which meant that they could approach funders and say i was a finalist or i was a winner yeah. in the innovation yeah. awards and and all of them mentioned that opportunity that it gave them and none of them mentioned actually the prize money was really good <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, of course. so it's no, the doors it that. opens Thank rather you. than the, the the actual money that's handed over yeah 
I mean, I guess my main question was, is that was is that part of the uh, prize to go towards funding? Does it not? Does he answer that question anyway? That's great. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's not restricted. The, the money that, that, that you would win wouldn't be restricted. Alison. Hello, thank you. And uh, thank you for doing the work that you're doing. And my, my sense is, uh, you know, my sort of loneliness in being a little innovator somewhere has diminished already. So thank you for that. So I've got two questions, if I may. The, the first one is that the project that I've been doing, which is around shifting the culture in primary care with our GPs, them attending to their suffering and the suffering of all of the people that they see. Currently, just in Gloucestershire, it's being um, it's been recognised and funded by NHS England, what used to be Health Education England, but only a small amount and only for this year and only in Gloucestershire. And what I would love to do is to spread it out, you know, spread the learning out with GP colleagues. Um, and so my question is, does that exclude me? because I've had that kind of pot of money put to this project. That's the first one. And the second one is around diversity and inclusion, because they're not, they are quite hard to reach group GPs, but they're not terribly diverse, but their patient groups are. So it's, I'd be really interested in your responses to both of those questions. I'd be happy to field that, but Menke, would you like to, to step in on that? Um, yeah, on, on the second one, I don't think that's an issue at all. And I could see, um, yeah, Richard and, and Ben uh, kind of nodding as well as, as you spoke about GPs, like, you know, um, uh, the, the diversity in, um, issues is not, you know, is, is not um, a problem, but uh, the uh, first question that you asked, I was just wondering about that because um, when you when you say that you've already had that pot of funding, do you do you feel that it's an early stage innovation? Uh, well, we how many courses? I did five or six pilot courses using this particular approach, and we've really, really the intent is around embedding mindfulness within primary care and developing. And it's sangha it, it, across those communities. And I don't call it that, but that's that is what it is. <laughs> um, and uh, there was this pot of money floating around, and we got it in order to run six more courses. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that sounds great. So we 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 have to look at it more closely with the application. But um, uh, yeah, does anyone what else want to weigh in on that, Vin? Oh, yeah, I, I would say. In terms of the inspiration that we hope to provide to other people to see how you've been ingenious and creative in getting as far as you've got, that's yeah. worth celebrating. Yeah. And then in terms of continuing it, that's kind of, I wouldn't be too bothered if a, a plan is going to stay very small and focused, but I'm also enthusiastic if somebody's got dreams of saying, this is what I've learned, and it could be scaled as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. I, I, I agree with both of those perspectives. Absolutely. S. Oh, hello. Um, I've just got a few questions and I hope you can help. We can hear me. Yes. So, brilliant. so my understanding is, so I'm really new to this. So um, my understanding is that it can be like a training program that you can change and make creative like an MBSR, for example, that's the idea I've got. In, like, that's my understanding. That's one thing that you could do. So just to kind of move on from that, if you're, um, so in terms of like scientific evidence, if you've got an idea, ideas often happen without backing sometimes, right? Like as in when you're in the community, when you're doing outreach work, a lot of things occur when, there's not been a lot of research in it. So it's kind of come from your lived experience. So that's one of my questions that, you know, there might be some evidence, but there might, it might not be, there might not be a lot. And is that okay? Like, is the lived experience element 
quite powerful. And do you have to have done pilots? Like, um, just to, because I would like to apply, but I'm not sure. I'm quite passionate about innovation, but I'm just like, I, I don't know, because it's the first time. So I just wanted to elaborate on the pilot bit as well. Like, what does a early stage intervention mean? Thank you very much. Well, well. Can I just ask, um, are you a, are you a mindfulness teacher then? Or I am. Yes, I am. I am. MBSR. I teach the. Uh, yes, yeah. I teach the MBSR, but um, um, from my lived experience, I kind of found certain things work better. From my my journey as being a woman of color, and also like other 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 like things, barriers that I've seen. Yeah. 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 I no. I, I, oh, sorry, Nick. I was just I was just going to say that that. that um, Sorry, uh, that the um, the point that you that you highlighted about the um, need to adapt in the context of community and uh, informed by your lived experience is so powerful. Um, and I think uh, the conventional training programs are more and more including that as part of their teaching to say that they're you know when you're out there you're going to need to have to change certain things. And how to how to know how to do that skillfully? Um, there's this warp and weft idea of the things that need to stay as they are, and, and the things that you can be more creative with. And there's been a second paper, which is kind of warp and weft part two, which it goes into that a bit more deeply. But it's it's such a I mean such a nuanced thing, isn't it? Um, but in terms of an innovation, um, this is where we we talk about it being more than uh, like in, in, in kind of a a, a single instance or a, a kind of intuitive sense that you have or um, uh, an idea to become a bit more formalized and to say that, okay, this is a new approach that, that I've tried now for how, the last few years that I've been teaching. And I, I, I think that others might benefit from it too. And so it, it starts um, having like an identity of its own and that others could engage with it and benefit from it. So. So yeah, that's not directly answering your question, but it's just saying that it just depends on where you are on that on that journey, um, as to uh, whether whether um, you would consider consider this as an, an as as something that you would want to apply for. Um, but when it comes to uh, the pilot, it sounds like you're already testing it out. It's just um, whether whether the, it's, whether you formalize that testing to say well. If it's hard to do in context of community to say, well, if I hadn't done this helpful thing, which I believe in, and have a comparison between doing it and not doing it, which one is going to be better? Because you don't want to let anyone down. So if you think something's better, you're going to do it for everyone, right? So, but 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 unfortunately, that's the only way of knowing for sure that actually your adaptation is better than not having made that adaptation. So that's um, the benefit of of doing some kind of a early stage um, research. I think what um, I noticed from some of the innovation was that they were quite early stage, but people had, it's not, you wouldn't even call it research, but it's more proof of concept. They've done something and, and see, is this worth pursuing? But I think the, the real power is when somebody looks at a problem and analyzes it, and because of their own particular personal or professional experience, understands the problem and then comes up with a this is how it could be better that maybe a larger organization doesn't have that insight that, that's what really moved me when i was looking at, in, uh, at innovations people who had an insight and then adapted creatively in response to that not just for its own sake and it, it sounds like you do have an insight thank you Vin. thank you thanks a lot does anybody have any further questions? Fantastic. Um, well, we, it's taken us to five past five, so we've we've overrun just very very slightly, but we've we've kept a good time really. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for coming. I would encourage you to to apply for the awards, and if you do have any any questions, please do do email us. Um, um, because we're, we're still at hand to answer any questions as, as we get towards the, the closing date. Um, so don't feel that if, if something springs to mind, you just have to sit on it and, and muddle through. Um, and if you have any doubts at all, please just contact us. We'd rather, we'd rather you applied and we gave you feedback than you, you hid in a corner and didn't apply. 
Um, so, so please do engage in this. It's, it's, you know, it's something that means a lot to us to promote innovation. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for your time today. Um, add something, we'll, Rich. Can I just yes, add, go for it. Yeah, just, just a thought. You know, there's not many of us here now, but I think in a sense you've done a service to other people by asking questions. Mm. Just from experience last year, we had almost 40 applications based on not a very big um, initial launch event. And so I think your questions are going to help other people as well. That in itself is being part of the community, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely quite right. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, go well.